Welcome. Our apartment field presents Skin Garden. A collection of three-dimensional musings and flesh presented in three rooms. This exhibition is about bodies. You here are no strings. No strings for me. Changing bodies. Drop quickly down the spine. Going up. The bodies move. Swished with music. Bodies. From a distance. Posture, face, tone, voice between your teeth. Any body. Sounds of fear. Our bodies. Don't look at me. My voice is bigger than my head. We are bodies. And the pulse of Thank you for attending day 3 of Skin Garden's opening, our debut showcase. We're so happy you're here. We will be streaming theory and literature that inspire the room, Reconsider Flesh, a breathing sculpture garden which opened today in New Art City. Visit outputfield.com slash skinned to walk around inside this room. You should also check out the two other rooms, they're also audiovisual explorations of bodies. Today's broadcast will feature the words of these artists and writers. Gordon Hall. Gilles Deleuze. Feli Squattery. Bob Flanagan. We will be streaming excerpts from Gordon Hall's Why I Don't Talk About the Body, a polemic positioned against the language used to discuss bodies in the English-speaking art world. Gordon Hall is a sculptor, performance maker, and writer based in New York. Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, How Do You Make Yourself a Body Without Organs? An essay simultaneously distinguishing and using both physical and intangible parts of our bodies. Bob Flanagan, Why? A poem about body, choice, and desire. Bob Flanagan was a performance artist and poet whose writing and bizarre sadomasochistic performances centered on his lifelong battle with cystic fibrosis. Essays and writings from these thinkers had great influence on our virtual gallery. Reconsider Flesh. Curated by Viv Q and Salome Shatrio. Reconsider Flesh is a non-chronological, anti-categorical spectrum of digital bodies. This breathing sculpture garden, presents virtual presentations of skin, flesh, and bone inside a breathing organic grotto sculpted by Salome Shatrio. Move through as you navigate the walls Salome sculpted by capturing data from measuring breathing. 
These bodies are layered with Bella Bagwina's distorted readings of Gordon Hall's Why I Don't Talk About the Body, a polemic on the turn of phrase the body and the damaging effects of such language in the English-speaking art world. This space is an embodiment of the multiplicity of flesh, one that Gordon states is too often substituted with the singular verbiage, the body. Drawing from her shared experience of having a trans body as it were, Bella Bagwina sounds out Gordon's theory inside this fleshy assemblage. We consider flesh carves out a space for just some of the bodies excluded when multitudes are reduced to a monolith. Critical Broadcast is an ongoing series by Output Field where we stream assemblages of theory, literature, and sound art to raise funds for our cause, and others. In a couple minutes, we will broadcast thoughts on the multiplicity of bodies, the effects of desire, the language around bodies, and bodies without organs. If you hear or see something that resonates with you, please consider donating. Outputfield.com slash donate. Again, that's outputfield.com slash donate. Before we stream the literature that inspired Reconsider Flesh, we will continue to play Bella Bagwin's 9-minute soundscape for it. It is a deconstructed reading of Gordon Hall's essay. Listen closely, you may notice certain words and themes come to the fore. In us, some of us, some of us, the trans, some of us, some of us want to turn. While some others want to be blind in the past, some of us dysphoria. Some of us trapped. Some of us no one body. Some of us had surgeries. Some of us have had taken hormones. Some of us have a child or bodies in the way we wish. In the way we wish. I am more than a trans body. Do not put a name on my body. I'm looking for a name to my body. Take my body out. Take my body out. Do not put a name on my body. I am more than a trans body. of a difference. The spectacularity naked trans. The spectacularity naked trans. Body. Whether we ask to be read or refuse to be visible at all. I think about the bodies all the time Look at them, imagine them, respond to them in countless ways I think about my body and the bodies of other people I think about the bodies all the time When there are bodies, there are possibilities. Wherever there are bodies, there are the bodies. There is even the guarantee that there is the Am I or not separate from my body? Am I my body? Am I me and my body? 
body? Is there any other version of me that is not this body? I am my mind. I am my spirit. I am my sense. I am myself. Myself. All aspects of my embodiment. If you saw anything that resonated with you, please donate to our cause. Help us reach the pattern. Nourish experimental arts.
please donate to our cause. Help us reach the cannon. Nourish experimental arts. We will now begin streaming the essay that inspired the soundscape. This audio is sourced from Shimmer Shimmer's podcast series, Across the Way With. It is read by Gordon Hall. We will be streaming excerpts from Gordon Hall's Why I Don't Talk About the Body, a polemic positioned against the language used to discuss bodies in the English-speaking art world. Gordon Hall is a sculptor, performance maker, and writer based in New York. Why I Don't Talk About the Body, a Polemic, by Gordon Hall, published in Monday Art Journal, Volume 4, 2020, guest edited by Danny Giles, on the theme of white pictures. How we speak matters, because the language we use shapes how we understand the world. Language is also viral. How we talk transfers to others in the communities we participate in, and we take up the speech patterns of others, often without realizing it. Over the last several years, I've been focused on a particular turn of phrase widely used in the English-speaking art world, the body. I'm not referring to any possible use of the combination of these two words. I'm focused on the way this term gets used to mean something akin to bodies in general, As in, quote, the creation of objects and scenes that are intimately connected to the body, end quote. Or, quote, known for his drawings, paintings, and sculptures that explore identity, the body, and masculinity, end quote. These examples and countless others substitute a multiplicity of possible bodies with this singularized concept form, the body. Speaking about the body is a way of referencing bodies that do not belong to anyone in particular, but that have ceased to be multiple. It's certainly not that I think we shouldn't be focused on bodies. I think and talk about bodies all the time, not to mention look at them, imagine them, and respond to them in countless ways in my life and work. I think about my body and the bodies of other people, people who are similar to me and those who are different. I think that in this political moment of accelerating environmental destruction, labor precarity, and technological transformation, we need to be concerned with bodies, perhaps more than ever. The first and what seems to me the most obvious objection to this term is that it generalizes across bodily difference. Insofar as it does not refer to a plurality, it creates one body as a stand-in for all of us. Depending on the specifics of where this term is used, this singular body is usually one that walks, is of standard vertical adult height, and that sees and hears and senses in quote-unquote normal ways. This body is not in a wheelchair, not deaf, not blind, not autistic, not ill, not high, not any of the other endless ways that our bodies and our senses deviate from a normalizing standard. In other words, quote-unquote, the body of the viewer, is almost always a non-disabled and typical body, as close as possible to a normative ideal body, in other words, a body that is arguably a non-existent fantasy. The term, the body, disregards the full range of bodily differences in favor of prioritizing typicality, standardization, and predictability. In doing so, It aspires toward an inaccessible world, designed for the typical, and disregarding the different. But talking about bodies instead of the body is more than a semantic difference. A body that we haven't specified is not the same as a body in general. Bodies, plural, means something distinct from the body, 
even when we don't describe in detail the differences between the singular bodies that make up the plurality of bodies. An implied multiplicity is very different than the substitution of a monolith. Wherever there are bodies, there is the possibility, even the guarantee, that there is difference. Our use of language should reflect this. This critique of the way the body generalizes could also be applied to the two other major categories of bodily difference, race and gender. The bodies of the body are not complicated by difference. They are raceless, genderless, and sexless. Not only does this often end up resulting in an implicit default to the norm of the white cisgender male body, it also disavows the possibility that these kinds of distinctions could make much difference to what these bodies see, feel, and do. The body reifies bodily norms in all of these ways. It is curious to me that in this particular moment in which many in the arts are focused with zeal on diversity, inclusion, and difference, we continue to use a term that is so incompatible with these investments. My second objection to the term the body is that it implicitly sets up a binary between bodies and other capacities, qualities, or modes of experience. To speak of the body is to distinguish it from what it is not, the soul, the spirit, or, most commonly, the mind. Rooted in Judeo-Christian religious thought, this way of thinking has even been discredited by Western biological science, which, over the last couple of decades, has had to grudgingly admit that thoughts, emotions, and experiences have bodily effects that are every bit as real as viruses and pathogens. And so, though we might be getting incrementally closer to admitting that a binary made up of the body and the mind is empirically inaccurate, our language still supports this theory of human life. For instance, the sentence, I have a body, while totally normal, is not the sentence I really want to say because I don't believe in what it implies. Who is this I who has my body? Is my body something I own? Am I inside of it? Am I distinct from my body? What I really want to say in this instance is not that I have a body, but that I am fundamentally and completely my body. There is absolutely no version of me that is not this body. My mind, my spirit, and my sense of self are all aspects of my embodiment. I-body might be closer to what I mean, cornered into making up a word to describe this non-dualistic understanding of bodies. We are linguistically prevented from thinking otherwise. My third objection to the body is that it tends to situate our bodies as perceptual tools that operate according to established rules that are prior to ideology and interpretation. In this version, our bodies are the keepers of our basic needs and the tool through which we perceive the world. But even if we agree that most bodies have the same basic needs and functions, this does not foreclose the reality that these needs and functions are also historical, cultural, and constantly changing. Not only do we see, hear, and feel in radically different ways, one person to the next, but the ways we use our bodies and our senses are historical. What we see and feel is made possible by the cultural conditions that structure our understandings of what is possible, what is impossible, and what is even there to be sensed at all. Our bodies cannot be understood as either non-ideological biological entities or as neutral perceptual apparatuses. The argument could be made that because the body generalizes, we can respond by reinserting categories of difference. If the body is based on normalizing standards, why not use the term the disabled body? Or if the body has been historically unmarked and thus implicitly coded as white and male, why not talk about the female body or the trans body or the black body? As these terms are widely used, they are one response to this need for reinserting the specificity of various bodily categories. I feel entitled to go after the term, the trans body, in that this kind of body is apparently the one that I have. From my position in a community of transgender people, 
I can conclusively state that there is nothing in particular that makes our bodies feel or appear the same as one another. Some of us quote unquote look trans while others of us don't. Some of us want to look trans while others of us want to blend in and pass. Some of us have what the medical world refers to as dysphoria, while others of us don't feel anything that we could describe as being, quote, trapped in the wrong body. The body as vessel appears again. Some of us have had surgeries, taken hormones, or undergone other procedures to alter our bodies in the ways we wish, and some of us haven't. Trans is a term that didn't even enter into the popular or medical lexicon until the early 2000s, and it is one that many of us have taken up primarily to access services or explain ourselves to others using the most commonly accepted language we can find. It's possible that transgender people have more in common with everyone else than we usually admit. What's more ubiquitously human than feeling bad in relation to our bodies? Not only is there nothing that makes us similar enough to each other to describe us as having, quote, the trans body, I increasingly wonder if there is anything categorically distinct about us at all, except for the ways the medical and psychiatric communities have diagnosed us. My discomfort with this way of speaking is not just that it can be confusing, nonspecific, generalizing, exclusionary, or erasing. Though these are not minor objections, I believe that there is something even more serious at stake. In using these terms, we linguistically create a culture in which people are interchangeable with one another within categories of difference. When we talk about the black body, we inhabit a gaze that understands one black body to be effectively indistinguishable from another. This way of speaking positions us as outsiders looking in to see only the most visible markers of difference, loading them with significance that eclipses the particularity and diversity of the individuals within an identity category. When we parse human beings in this way within art institutional structures, we participate in a culture in which artists' bodies are used as visual evidence of their demographic categories. Speaking in this way makes it possible for institutions to frame artists primarily in terms of their identities. Finally, from the point of view of a museum or a curator who is operating within this body as evidence of difference rubric, artists of difference who do not make this difference publicly visible in their work are essentially useless because they do not help create a moment of public visibility of inclusion. I'll call this the bodies as evidence curatorial model, or the voguing in the lobby model, or maybe the spectacularly naked trans performance model. As long as these institutional approaches continue, the work of artists of difference who engage these strategies will continue to be simplified and misread, while others who don't work in these ways will continue to be marginalized. And perhaps, most importantly, museums will continue to cover their own asses while rendering substantive change forever on the horizon. Institutions must consider the diversity of the identities of those they include. But this cannot mean that white men get to continue to be artists while everyone else must be female artists, black artists, and trans artists representing the body specific to their identity categories. There is no part of this argument that favors particular kinds of artistic work above others, figurative, abstract, body-based performance, and so on. Instead, I am critical of the framing devices that surround artists' work, how what we do gets described, presented, contextualized, and circulated. One primary way that these processes take place is through the use of language, including the ways that artists describe ourselves and our own work, which returns us to the body and its identity-specific varieties. By describing bodies in generalized ways that rely on the most visible markers of difference, we serve ourselves up in simplified, consumable, representational bites in ways that painfully undercut the complexity, 
particularity, and multiplicity of our work and lived experiences. This language conjures a world in which our bodies have value only in so far as they serve as public examples. This is not a way of being valued that we should accept for ourselves or promote for the benefit of institutions and their publics. Our job is to make specific artworks with our many different bodies, whether we ask to be read or refuse to be visible at all. If you saw anything that resonated with you, please donate to our cause. Help us reach the pattern. Nourish experimental art. We will now begin streaming how to make yourself a body without organs. Grace yourself, dense text imminent. If you'd like to discuss this or any text after the show, join our Discord. We'd love to find people to talk about what the hell a body without organs is. Outputfield.com slash Discord. Once again, that's Outputfield.com slash Discord. How to make yourself a body without organs by Gilles de Luz and Felix Guattari. November 28, 1947. Audio reading sourced from Black Flag Audiobooks. How do you make yourself a body without organs? Is an essay simultaneously distinguishing and using both physical and intangible parts of our bodies. You never reach the body without organs. You can't reach it. You are forever attaining it. It is a limit. People ask, so what is this body without organs? All she has left is the skin and bones of a disorganized body. Is it really so sad and dangerous to be fed up with seeing with your eyes, breathing with your lungs, swallowing with your mouth, talking with your tongue, thinking with your brain, having an anus and larynx, head and legs? Why not walk on your head, sing with your sinuses, see through your skin, breathe with your belly? Where psychoanalysis says, stop, find yourself again. We should say instead, let's go further still. We haven't found our body without organs yet. We haven't sufficiently dismantled ourself. The body without organs is what remains when you take everything away. What you take away is precisely the fantasy and significances and subjectifications as a whole. Psychoanalysis does the opposite. It translates everything into fantasies. It converts everything into fantasy. It retains the fantasy. It royally botches the real because it botches the body without organs. It is false to say that the masochist is looking for pain, but just as false to say that he is looking for pleasure in a particularly suspensive or roundabout way. The masochist is looking for a type of body without organs that only pain can feel or travel over due to the very conditions under which that body without organs was constituted. Pains are populations, packs, modes of king masochist in the desert that he engenders and augments. The same goes for the drugged body and intensities of cold refrigerator waves. 
For each type of body without organs, we must ask, one, what type is it? How is it fabricated? By what procedures and means predetermining what will come to pass? Two, what are its modes? What comes to pass? And with what variance and what surprises? What is unexpected and what expected? It is a very delicate experimentation since there must not be any stagnation on the modes or slippage in type. The masochist and the drug user court these ever-present dangers that empty their body without organs instead of filling them. Body without organs is made in such a way that it can be occupied, populated only by intensities. Only intensities pass and circulate. Still, the body without organs is not a scene, a place, or even a support upon which something comes to pass. It has nothing to do with fantasy. There is nothing to interpret. The body without organs causes intensities to pass. It produces and distributes them in a spatium that is itself intensive, lacking extension. It is not space, nor is it in space. It is matter that occupies space to a given degree, to the degree corresponding to the intensities produced. It is non-stratified, unformed, intense matter, the matrix of intensity, intensity equals zero. But there is nothing negative about that zero. There are no negative or opposite intensities. The problem of whether there is a substance of all substances, a single substance for all attributes, becomes, is there a totality of all body without organs? If the body without organs is already a limit, what must we say of the totality of the body without organs? It is a problem not of the one and the multiple, but of a fusional multiplicity that effectively goes beyond any opposition between the one and the multiple. A formal multiplicity of substantial attributes that, as such, constitutes the ontological unity of substance. There is a continuum of all the attributes or genuses of intensity under a single substance and a continuum of the intensities of a certain genus under a single type or attribute. A continuum of all substances in intensity and of all intensities in substance. The uninterrupted continuum of the body without organs. Body without organs, immanence, imminent limit. The body without organs is the field of immanence of desire, the plane of consistency specific to desire, with desire defined as a process of production without reference to any exterior agency, whether it be a lack that hollows it out or a pleasure that fills it. Take the interpretation of masochism. When the ridiculous death instinct is not invoked, it is claimed that the masochist, like everybody else, is after pleasure but can only get it through pain and fantasied humiliations whose function is to allay or ward off deep anxiety. This is inaccurate. The masochist's suffering is the price he must pay not to achieve pleasure, but to untie the pseudo-bond between desire and pleasure as an extrinsic measure. Pleasure is in no way something that can be attained only by a detour through suffering. It is something that must be delayed as long as possible because it interrupts the continuous process of positive desire. There is in fact a joy that is imminent to desire as though desire were filled by itself and its contemplations, a joy that implies no lack or impossibility and is not measured by pleasure since it is what distributes intensities of pleasure and prevents them from being suffused by anxiety, shame, and guilt. In short, the masochist uses suffering as a way of constituting a body without organs and bringing forth a plane of consistency of desire. That there are other ways, other procedures than masochism, and certainly better ones, is beside the point. 
It is enough that some find this procedure suitable for them. It is a question of forces. The masochist presents it this way. Training axiom, destroy the instinctive forces in order to replace them with transmitted forces. The renunciation of external pleasure, or its delay, its infinite regress, testifies on the contrary to an achieved state in which desire no longer lacks anything, but feels itself and constructs its own field of imminence. Pleasure is an affection of a person or a subject. It is the only way for persons to find themselves in the process of desire that exceeds them. Pleasures, even the most artificial, are re-territorializations. We come to the gradual realization that the body without organs is not at all the opposite of the organs. The organs are not its enemies. The enemy is the organism. The body without organs is opposed not to the organs, but to the organization of the organs called the organism. It is true that Arto wages a struggle against the organs, but at the same time, what he is going after, what he has it in for is the organism. The body is the body, alone it stands, and in no need of organs. Organism it never is. Organisms are the enemies of the body. The body without organs is not opposed to the organs. Rather, the body without organs and its true organs, which must be composed and positioned, are opposed to the organism, the organic organization of the organs, the judgment of God, the system of the judgment of God. The theological system is precisely the operation of he who makes an organism, an organization of organs called the organism. Because he cannot bear the body without organs, because he pursues it and rips it apart so he can be first and have the organism be first. The organism is already that, the judgment of God, from which medical doctors benefit and on which they base their power. The organism is not at all the body, the body without organs. Rather, it is a stratum on the body without organs. In other words, a phenomenon of accumulation, coagulation, and sedimentation that, in order to extract useful labor from the body without organs, imposes upon its forms, functions, bonds, dominant and hierarchized organizations, organized transcendences. The strata are bonds, pincers, Tie me up if you wish. We are continually stratified. But who is this we that is not me? For the subject no less than the organism belongs to and depends on a stratum. The body without organs howls. They've made me an organism. They've wrongfully folded me. They've stolen my body. The judgment of God uproots it from its imminence and makes it an organism, a signification, a subject. It is the body without organs that is stratified. It swings between two poles. The surfaces of stratification into which it is recoiled, on which it submits to the judgment and the plane of consistency in which it unfurls and opens to experimentation. If the body without organs is a limit, if one is forever attaining it, it is because... Behind each stratum, encasted in it, there is always another stratum. A perpetual and violent combat between the plane of consistency, which frees the body without organs, cutting across and dismantling all of the strata and the surfaces of stratification that block it or make it recoil. Dismantling the organism has never meant killing yourself but rather opening the body to connections that presuppose an entire assemblage, circuits, conjunctions, levels, and thresholds, passages and distributions of intensity, and territories and deterritorializations measured with the craft of a surveyor, tearing the conscious away from the subject in order to make it a means of exploration tearing the unconscious away from significance and interpretation in order to make it a veritable production. 
This is assuredly no more or less difficult than tearing the body away from the organism. You have to keep enough of the organism for it to reform each dawn, and you have to keep small supplies of significance and subjectification, if only to turn them against their own systems when the circumstances demand it, when things, persons, even situations force you to. And you have to keep small rations of subjectivity in sufficient quantity to enable you to respond to the dominant reality, mimic the strata. It is only there that the body without organs reveals itself for what it is. Connection of desires, conjunction of flows, continuum of intensities. You have constructed your own little machine ready when needed to be plugged into the other collective machines. For the body without organs is all of that, necessarily a place, necessarily a plane, necessarily a collectivity, assembling elements, things, plants, animals, tools, people, powers, and fragments of all of these. For it is not my body without organs, instead the me is on it, or what remains of me unalterable and changing in form, crossing thresholds. Thus the body without organs is never yours or mine. It is always a body. It is no more projective than it is regressive. It is an involution, but always a contemporary creative involution. The organs distribute themselves on the body without organs, but they distribute themselves independently of the form of the organism, Forms become contingent. Organs are no longer anything more than intensities that are produced. Flows, thresholds, and gradients. A stomach, an eye, a mouth. The indefinite article does not lack anything. It is not indeterminate or undifferentiated, but expresses the pure determination of intensity, intensive difference. The indefinite article is the conductor of desire. It is not at all a question of a fragmented, splintered body of organs without the body. The body without organs is exactly the opposite. There are not organs in the sense of fragments in relation to a lost unity, nor is there a return to the undifferentiated in relation to a differentiable totality. There is a distribution of intensive principles of organs with their positive indefinite articles within a collectivity or multiplicity, inside an assemblage. And according to machinic connections operating on a body without organs, Logos Spermaticos, the error of psychoanalysis was to understand body without organs phenomena as regressions, projections, fantasies, in terms of an image of the body. As a result, it only grasps the flip side of the body without organs and immediately substitutes family photos, childhood memories, and part objects for a worldwide intensity map. It understands nothing about the egg, nor about indefinite articles, nor about the contemporaneousness of a continually self-constructing milieu. The body without organs is desire. It is that which one desires and by which one desires. And not only because it is the plane of consistency or the field of imminence of desire, even when it falls into the void of too sudden destratification or into the proliferation of a cancerous stratum, it is still desire. Desire stretches that far, desiring one's own annihilation or desiring the power to annihilate. It is a problem not of ideology but of pure matter, a phenomenon of physical, biological, psychic, social, or cosmic matter. If you saw anything that resonated with you, please donate to our Help us reach the canon. Nourish experimental arts. Reach, reach the canon. 
Did anything resonate with your body? If anything touched you, please donate to our cause. Help us reach the cabin. Nourish experimental arts. We will now begin streaming Why, a poem about body, choice, and desire. Bob Flanagan was a performance artist and poet whose writing and bizarre sadomasochistic performances centered on his lifelong battle with cystic fibrosis. Why? Bob Flanagan. 1985. Because it makes me come. Because I'm sick. Because there was so much sickness. Because I say fuck the sickness. Because I like the attention. Because I was alone a lot, because I was different, because kids beat me up on the way to school, because I was humiliated by nuns, because of Christ and the crucifixion, because of porky pig in bondage, force-fed by some sinister creep in a black cape, because of stories about children hung by their wrists, burned on the stove, scalded in tubs, because of mutiny on the bounty, because of cowboys and Indians, because of Houdini, <coughs> because of my cousin Cliff, because of the forts we built and the things we did inside them because of what's inside me, because of my genes, because of my parents, because of doctors and nurses, because they tied me to the crib so I wouldn't hurt myself, because I had time to think, because I had time to hold my penis, because I had awful stomach aches and holding my penis made it feel better, because I felt like I was going to die, because it makes me feel invincible, because it makes me feel triumphant, <clears throat> because I'm a Catholic, because I still love Lent and I still love my penis, and in spite of it all I have no guilt, because my parents said be what you want to be and this is what I want to be, because I'm nothing but a big baby and I want to stay that way and I want a mommy forever, even a mean one, especially a mean one. Because of all the fairy tale witches and the wicked stepmother and the stepsisters and how sexy Cinderella was, smudged with soot, doomed to a life of servitude. Because of Hansel, locked in the witch's cage until he was fat enough to eat. Because of O oh, and how desperately I wanted to be her. Because of my dreams because of the games we played, because I've got an active imagination, because my mother bought me tinker toys, because hardware stores give me hard-ons, because of hammers, nails, clothespins, wood, padlocks, pulleys, eyeballs, thumbtacks, staple guns, sewing needles, wooden spoons, fishing tackle, chains, metal rulers, rubber tubing, spatulas, rope, twine, C-clamps, S-hooks, razor blades, scissors, tweezers, knives, push pins, two-by-fours, <coughs> ping-pong paddles, Alligator clips, duct tape, broomsticks, barbecue skewers, bungee cords, sawhorses, soldering irons. Because of tool sheds, because of garages, because of basements, <coughs> because of dungeons, because of the pit and the pendulum. Because of the Tower of London, because of the Inquisition, because of the rack, because of the cross, because of the Adams family playroom. Because of Morticia Adams and her black dress with its octopus legs. Because of motherhood, because of Amazons, because of the goddess, because of the moon. Because it's in my nature, because it's against nature because it's nasty, because it's fun, because it flies in the face of all that's normal, whatever that is. Because I'm not normal, because I used to think that I was part of some vast experiment and that there was this implant in my penis that made me do these things and allowed them, wherever they were, to monitor my activities. Because I had to take my clothes off and lie inside this giant plastic bag so the doctors could collect my sweat. Because once upon a time I had such a high fever my parents had to strip me naked and wrap me in wet sheets to stop the convulsions because my parents loved me even more when I was suffering, because I was born into a world of suffering, because surrender is sweet, because I'm attracted to it, because I'm addicted to it, because endorphins in the brain are like a natural kind of heroin, because I learned to take my medicine, because I was a big boy for taking it, because I can take it like a man, because as somebody once said, he's got more balls than I do, because it is an act of courage, because it does take guts, because I'm proud of it, because I can't climb mountains, because I'm terrible at sports, because no pain, no gain. Because spare the rod and spoil the child. Because you always hurt the one you love. What you just heard was theory slash literature that inspired the room. Reconsider Flesh, a breathing sculpture garden which opened today in New Art City. Visit at putfield.com slash skint garden to walk around inside this room. 
you should also check out the two other rooms, they're also audiovisual explorations of bodies. If you saw anything that resonated with you, please donate to our cause. Help us reach the panel. Nourish experimental art. Prisons Skin Garden, a collection of three dimensional musings and flesh presented in three rooms. This exhibition is about bodies. You are no strings, no strings for me. Changing bodies. Shift to the 